Okay, so we're going to get started. Uh, apparently, a lot of people decided to stay away <laughs> after Labor Day, so such is life. Um, it'll, it'll happen again in about two or three weeks when you have your first round of midterms. People stop showing up. It's just the nature of things. Anyway, for those of you that are here, thank you for being here. Um, we're going to start today. It's kind of a two-parter today. First part, we're going to go through a bunch of examples of previous work and kind of Photoshop collage work, some student work, some professional work. <laughs> to hopefully get you inspired about what you're doing for your assignment 102, give you some ideas, start, start that thinking process. Um, it is due a week from today, so it's due next Wednesday. We'll work today after we go through the examples. We'll work a lot on isolating objects. So how do you cut things out and then ultimately be able to reuse them? But we'll also work, I want to teach you basically cutting things out and also the clone stamp tool. So we're going to work on tiling textures too, and I'll show you how to do that. Uh, as part of what we're doing today. So there's kind of two parts to the to the demonstration portion. But before we get into that, let's talk through some examples, um, because I think sometimes examples are the best way of showing you what can be done with Photoshop. So the fun thing about Photoshop is you can bend reality. You can make things that can't really happen, but you can trick somebody, me, you, into believing that it's real. And so obviously something like this is not real, but at the same time, it's done in a way that it could be real. And that's kind of the fun of Photoshop. And I want you guys to, to be able to have this kind of fun and to be able to do these things such that they're really believable. And as I go through the slides today, I'm going to talk about the kinds of things on these images that make them work and the techniques that were used that make them work. So in an image like this one, for example, a lot of this has to do with how the original photographs were shot. So they were shot with a flash, head on, background is all black. And the way that they're shot makes them combine together nicely. They're at the same, uh, the same exposure, the same settings in the camera. And that allows you to do some clone stamping and do some masking and get those two pieces to come together. This is probably the most simple example of how to set something like this up. Okay, so in this, and, and um, this is not a student example, but it's certainly something that somebody could do as a student example. What you do is you set up the camera somewhere in the bathroom in this example. And you're going to take a picture of you or somebody standing. And that picture is going to have you, the standard reflection that is in the mirror. So uh, then we would set up, and this is my red line is not going to work on here. Let's see if I can change color. I don't know where to change color. Well, we'll just have to deal with red line. So you've got your mirror. And the mirror originally has the reflection of the younger person in it. Then you swap the younger person out for the older person. And they stand right here, the older person. And you take the same picture. Okay, So you have one picture with the old person and that person's reflection. You have one picture with the young person and the young person's reflection. Then it's just a matter of using the skills that you learned last class and combining the two pictures together with the younger picture on top. And then you mask out this whole section so that it's transparent. And suddenly, you have the reflection of you looking at yourself when you're older. So you guys see how that setup works? It's pretty simple. It works well because it's the same lighting in the same room with the same shot. There's nothing mysterious about it. They didn't change anything. They didn't try to combine things that didn't belong together. So it makes it a rather easy one to do. So if you're struggling with it, this is a good place to start. It gets harder when you combine things that don't necessarily belong together or at different scales, and you adjust the scales to come together. Sometimes the results end up being a little on the creepy side. Sometimes they get really creepy. Sometimes they're bizarre. I think this one would be more successful if it had a background. There was a trend uh, four or five years ago where everybody was doing these white backgrounds. It's kind of when the I'm a Mac, I'm a PC commercials came out. Everybody wanted to do everything on white backgrounds. So there's a few of these that have the white backgrounds as part of it. This one, I think, is exceedingly well done because it's so subtle. And the transition between the toes and the leather works, especially because the wrinkles in the shoes match up with the wrinkles on the toes. So that's part of how these things kind of combine together and, and start to be, quote, realistic. They cause you to look at it and say, wait a minute, those, those, are they shoes or are they toes? Which are they? Now, of course, skin tones happen to match really well. If you were trying to, you know, if I was photographing my toes, for example, they wouldn't blend well with these shoes. And there's nothing I can really do other than shifting the color tone of my toes to make it work. 
And so you have to think through those kinds of options. Certainly you could do it. Something like this, it's a little bit, it's a little bit fake, but it works nicely because of the shadows. So if we look here at this, the light is coming from this side. We have the bright side on this side of the face. We have the dark side on this side of the face. The same thing in the plant. The bright side is here, and the dark side is over here. So therefore, these images combine together nicely. So a lot of how you combine images together is picking the images with similar lighting conditions. So if the images don't have similar lighting conditions, they're not going to look right together. This one, I've seen people try to do this one. It's much, much harder than it looks. And that's because you have to get the scales right, and you have to get the perspectives right. So in this, in this instance, we're, we're photographing down on the leaf. You have to be able to photograph the face in the same angle, because there's a slight perspective going back in this direction in that photograph. And you have to make sure that you're in the same position when you photograph the face. So the fact that the leaf is extending away from us here, like that, we're standing here looking down away from it. Same thing has to happen with the chin. So we have to see the bottom side of the chin, not the top of the head. So all that angle in the shot matters. Does that make sense? So you have to really carefully consider these things. If I just took a random face and I tried to put the random face on the leaf, it wouldn't work as well because they weren't meant to go together. They weren't carefully conceived. And that's a lot of what makes these uh, really thrive. So these ones are kind of fun too, where you take a piece and you blow it up and you bring it in the foreground, or you have your hand entering the, the scene from outside of the scene. Those kinds of things can work really well. I've seen a lot with drawings. So we have drawing entering into the scene, those kinds of pieces. Sometimes it's just about wandering around and getting an idea. So in this case, you're wandering around through the grocery store. You see all the butt ends of the carrots. Well, what if one of the butt ends was an eyeball? Now, if I were doing this, um, again, this is actually one I did when I was an undergrad. Um, back when it was Photoshop, I think it was Photoshop 6 or something. That's like 10 versions ago or 11 versions ago, Photoshop. Uh, so it's not, it's not as clean as it otherwise could be. <laughs> it could have been better, but it was a while ago. But if I were doing this again, I would think a little bit more carefully about rule of thirds, composition. I would pick the carrot not so far over to the side. I would pick it a little bit more. You know, I might have changed the whole composition, changed the cropping such that there was a carrot right about here so instead. Right. right. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's just a matter of thinking through that. So the reason that I bring that up is don't forget about the rules of composition. Don't forget about that stuff we talked about before. It's still relevant now when you're setting this stuff up. I love this one. This is just fantastic. It's harder to do because it's so bright. I think the hands are a little, the shadows in the hands are a little bit too dark. If it were uh, toned down just a little bit, it would be a little more realistic. But there's something about this grunge in the bathroom that kind of works anyway. Um, and in this case, it's really a matter of making sure that your hands are in the correct position so it actually looks like you're clambering out of the, the toilet bowl, which obviously the person wasn't. So you have to kind of think through how do you do that. Maybe you have to hold on to a bowl or a pipe or something to try to get your hand in that proper position so that it matches up uh, with this angle. Again, lighting conditions matter as well. Great one. right? So this is another example of masking. Okay, so you take the picture, again, setting up the picture on a tripod or setting up the camera on a tripod or propping your camera up on a desk or, or something like that a lot of times can help in something like this. But here, you're taking the picture looking down. Obviously, there's one where you have the pants down and you have your toes it, like it would be normal. right? Then you take another, you carefully step out of the pants and you take another version of just the pants without your toes or anything in there. And then it's a matter of masking the two together. So you have to keep the folds of the pants the same, but essentially the only part that really matters is the inside. Because you're going to substitute the part that has your legs in it for the inside of the pants. That's how you make it go away. So it's just a simple mask. It's, it's like the first one that I showed you with the uh, old person in the mirror. The difference being is that mask is a nice rectangle, easy to do. This one is a little bit more complicated because it goes in and out of the pants, but still very easy just masking the two pieces together. Something like this is a lot harder. It takes a little bit more, more effort in Photoshop to do these kinds of manipulations, uh, but they're still pretty cool when they come out. So this one is really well done, particularly because of the way the shadowing works in here and the way that the lighting has been considered about where, where's the bright spot in the image, where's the dark spot in the image, how is the photograph done, 
uh, that starts to, to really assist in this. This one just is goofy, but I like it. Another example of the reflection, you know, in the, in the first example, it was the reflection of you as, as an older person. In this example, the kitten looking up at the lion uh, or looking down at the lion, so to speak. But part of the reason that this works is the, the image that was used that is the lion is shot such that it looks like the reflection. The sun's in the right place. The light looks like it belongs in, as part of the scene. If you take an image of, a, if you, you know, find an image of a lion and it's not shot at the right angle, kind of looking up at the lion the way it needs to be, it won't match up. So you have to be really careful about what these images are that go together. It takes thought and practice. These kinds of bending reality, you know, lifting something that's too heavy, those can be, those can be fun as well. Again, lighting conditions really matter. So as this, is, as this is set up, this shot, and I know it's a little blurry and I apologize for that, it's in the same room with the same, uh, the same camera position, same uh, setup here. I love these images. I don't have the speed of photography to be able to do something like this. So I show them to you just as they're kind of cool. I don't know, it's funny. In this one, you do also have to consider what is the inside look like. And as you're photographing that, you have to think about, you, you have to show this inside. So the baby peeking out, you have to find something that looks like that kind of tannish inside so the baby can be lifting it up and, and you can shoot that. And then it's just a matter of masking that part in to the mom. I like this one. Another different example. And so part of the reason I'm throwing these out there is because you might get inspired by different examples. So I'm showing you a variety and maybe one or, one or more of them will, will trigger something. And part of the reason this is really nicely done, and again, all of these slides are available online if you want to download them and see them in a higher resolution than, than what's on the projector, because I know the projector is not the best. But part of what makes this one particularly good is the way that the rock transitions into the scales of the fish. So if you look right in this zone, which is the, the challenging blending zone, you're going from the rocks of the island They've extended some of the rocks down in here, but they start to match up with where the scales are. And the size is about right for the scales of the fish. So that's part of why it works in this context. Lighting conditions, again, really important in an image like this. So you obviously have to come up with the idea. Oh, there's these six uh, overhead power lines. Let's swoop them into an electric guitar. But as you take this image, you would start with the, the actual um, scene that has the light, and you would look at that, and where's the sun in that condition, and then when you go to photograph the guitar, you want to make sure that the light source in the room is in the same place. So it's above and slightly to the right, so we get the right shadowing and the right halos and highlights on the guitar, and that's part of what allows them to combine together. So really study the light and what makes the light work in a particular scene. These Williams ones are always kind of fun. And again, it's just a matter of masking. It's setting it up and masking. You're masking out the legs where he's standing on the ground and masking in the, the part of the shirt um, that has the, the uh, person in it. Playing with perspective, so we're shooting up above and down below. The ceiling becomes both the floor and the ceiling, uh, which can be kind of entertaining. As I move through these, these are getting more and more challenging. Again, lighting conditions really matter in something like this, but this would be very hard to do. This one, I tried to brighten it up a little bit. The bed sheet transitions into like a snowy night scene on the floor. And so it's a matter of setting up the bed sheet to look right and then, and then getting the nice photograph of the snowy night scene as well. I love this one, I think it's so well done. Um, same camera position, same angles. There's a lot of setup that's involved in this. Two different days, one obviously bright and sunny, one not. Uh, and then a lot of the detail that goes in where you're hanging all of the, the, the curtains. And then like right in this area here. So as you're masking this together, again, just two photos, one of the bright sunny day, one of the, the not so bright sunny day. But as they put it together, they paid a lot of attention to these little gaps. And that starts to read really well as this canvas. Remember we did the blending mode with the dirt and the grunge. They're applying a little bit of that, that canvassy texture so these look like 
painting panels, not the actual photograph. So it's a combination of a lot of the techniques that we use that we end up with something that's really high quality like this. Again, this is not student work. This is, this is a little bit more advanced. But I like to point these things out. It's just kind of fun. They're all on the course web. These particular ones are all on the course website. If you go to Lecture 107, you can download the PDF. It has all the, the, the pictures on them. If you do a, a Google search for Photoshopped images, you'll, you'll come up with lots and lots of these. So just because I picked these, these were just ones that I thought were entertaining. Another example here, I think this one's really well done too. Um, dragging out the road. Two different shots, shot from the same uh, general vantage point. The keys here are that we're looking down. The light is at the same in both instances. So the light source is the same. The setup is one person here is pulling some kind of a grayish tarp with the right wrinkles and whatever. That then blends into the road that continues along. So it's, it's, it's a fun play on reality. Another example here, rowing through the, the fields. I love this one too, playing with perspective. So it's just a matter of shifting one view into another view into a third view. Sewing in winter, same scene, different seasons. This would be hard to do because you don't have the two seasons to work from, from the same, from the same shot. Sometimes they're just kind of goofy. But something like this obviously wouldn't work in reality, but it works kind of nicely here. OK, so let's look at some specific student examples. And I'll talk about why certain student examples have worked really nicely in the past. And obviously, you can look at other student examples. I showed this one a little bit earlier in the semester. The, um, in this case, it's, kind of see, it's, it's like when you look in the clouds and you see Abraham Lincoln or, or you know, the dog or whatever. It's the same kind of thing. You're looking at the rocks and you see the dog. And then uh, this particular student added in the actual dog mouth. So this is challenging because you have to get the lighting conditions right, but you also have to get the dog to make it match up, you know, the tongue and everything look right. Uh, and so it took him a lot of shots to get this particular setup correct, but the end result is that they come together really nicely. And they, they look like they belong together. So when Arash did this one, he doesn't have all these tattoos or anything. His was a lot about playing with the tattoos and blending the tattoos together, making himself somebody that he wasn't. Um, which was, which was certainly entertaining. This one, if you look carefully at it, it's a little on the creepy side. But again, it's just a matter of selectively masking and, and causing pieces to come forward. You've seen this one before as well, the combination of the cat and the, the, the woman. It works well, again, because of how subtle this is done. The wrinkles are done really nicely. So this one, terribly composed. No offense to the student. This was a long time ago. But from a lighting condition standpoint, it's one of the best ones that's ever been done. Not because it was complicated, but because the, the, the student spent a lot of time making sure that the light was correct. Okay, So in this case, it's two shots, flash on both shots, looking at the same angle, one of the pigs and one of the dogs. And then you're just substituting one of the pigs' heads for the dogs. So in this example, I like to show it because the lighting works so well and they blend so well together not because it's the best composition in the world. So I would love it if this was a little bit better composed. Sometimes they end up being a little bit more painterly or drawing based. I'm OK with that. And I'll show you some examples with even more drawing and, and kind of collage work in it. It's all part of the same strategy. Here we've got the dancer with the flower skirt. This one uh, was kind of a hybrid of that drawing. This is the reaching into the frame strategy where you have the drawing that's drawing on the tattoo on the back. I think this one is particularly well done because of the subtlety of the color. Most of the image is in black and white, except for the tattoo and the, um, the, the shirt. Everything else is in black and white and or drawn. So it's this kind of good combination of, uh, of strategies. This was on the handout. Um, a, again, very good example of this kind of collage work. Two images, one of the, the girl standing against the wall the second of the t-shirt hanging against the wall, and you're combining those two together with masks. Sometimes it's about bending reality. Obviously, you recognize the setting here. Uh, when Bekem did this one, she was sitting on a stool, one of the stools from the labs, 
uh, up against the wall. And then she took all of it away and photographed just the background. Again, same lighting conditions, shot from a tripod or, or a propped up phone or whatever. And that allows this to work. But part of the reason it works as well as it does is the stool, which was right here, is masked away. So that disappears. But the shadow is also masked away. So she's paying attention to the lighting conditions and the shadows to make it as if she's floating against the wall. And that's part of what makes this a really, really well done uh, example image. But it's just two images that you put together with some selective masking. Another example here, uh, waking up in the morning. Oh, my legs are gone. You know, these, these, are, these are the fun ways that you can bend reality. Good lighting conditions, well composed, it works nicely. A little bit different take, uh, but again, it, this took some time for the student to actually set up and make it work uh, within the context, but it ended up being very successful because of the way that the shadows and the light works and the combination of the two. There's another example of the little smoke drawings. I don't recommend these. These are really hard to do. This one's one of those ones where you have to stare a little bit at it. It's so subtle that it almost doesn't leap out at you right away. Right, but there's the face hidden in the bark. And so it's a very subtle sort of setup, but it was well done. Sometimes people like these, where it's the profile and the, the headshot combined together. Um, I've seen this be successful. Another example here with half the drawing, half the photograph and how they t the two combine together. I think this person was watching The Walking Dead at that time. <laughs> but you get the idea. Very, I should mention, extremely nicely composed. Right? Nice rule of thirds. The eyes are in the right place. Uh, the way that the circle works, it's just it's very nicely done. Another example here of this is a little bit more of uh, combining a variety of images, but the lighting conditions match. Therefore, we can combine the pieces together. OK, so those are all the examples that I have for you today. I told you we're going to go through a bunch of, of demo work, so I'm going to jump right into that. But give me a second to switch the computers over, uh, and then we'll go from there. OK, so um, as I said before, we're going to talk about some specific skills today. And I'm going to walk you through how these skills work. Um, because these are skills that you're going to have to have down the road. If you're doing any design work, whether it's in architecture or whether it's in industrial design or whether you're a graphic designer or whatever, you're going to need this skill. You're going to be able to need to isolate objects. You're going to be able to need to collage. And this is really the fundamentals of collage, is how do you get objects extracted from their environments such that you can manipulate them and work with them. So in a way, this is a two-part lecture because we're going to work through the stuff today, which is the first skill that you need, isolating the objects and, and clone stamping, tiling textures, that sort of thing. And then next week on Monday, we're going to take the objects that you cut out today, and we're going to put them in a scene where they don't belong. And so we're going to find a scene uh, online. We're going to analyze that scene, and then stick people into that scene and make it look like they were originally in that scene. And so I'm going to teach you that process um, earlier rather than later, because I think it's a skill you really need to be able to, to master. Uh, so today we're going to talk about just cutting people out, um, cutting objects out, cutting trees out. Whenever we do this, there are a variety of strategies for how to get there. And I've written up a lot of different strategies for how to do it. And as Photoshop evolves, the tools that we have evolve. And things get better. And you can cut things out a little bit easier than you used to. So uh, some of the initial steps that I'll show you will work. But there are better ways of doing it. And I'll emphasize those ways uh, as a little bit more important of a strategy. So uh, the first thing that I need is some source images. And in, in my case, I went to the Creative Commons search, and I looked up uh, people running. It doesn't really matter whether you're looking up people running or walking or whatever. I've found that if you type in people walking, you end up with lots of pictures of walking dead type things. So walking used to be the good strategy. <laughs> and, but you could try holding hands. I mean, you, it's a variety of search terms uh, that you're picking out. And what you're, what you're after, really, is a nice quality image that contains the whole person. And so in this context, this whole person is there. 
Unfortunately, in, in this case, her legs and, and stuff are a little bit blurry, so it might not be the best choice. The other thing that you want to make sure of is that when you're downloading it, you don't have a tiny little size. So this original was 1,000 by 666, which is pretty small. I'd rather have something a little bit bigger. So I'm going to go back, and I'm going to keep searching for something a little bit bigger. Unfortunately, when you put in running, there's people running. <laughs> there's lots of races. But there's a lot of things that I immediately skip over because they don't include the whole person. So like an image like this, yes, there's lots of people in the background that I could get rid of. Come on, sharpen up here a little bit. But see how the very bottom of her foot is cut off right there? That makes it less than ideal because I have to position her in a scene where the bottom of her foot is cut off because I don't have her whole foot. So these kinds of things are problematic. So it really, one of the, the, the challenges with doing this is finding the original image that actually looks and works um, as we go along. So let me try, try holding hands. And I've had, I've had terrible luck with Flickr. It's really running slow today. See, I have no, how about walking on beach? See, sometimes it's a matter of, of just trying different search terms. I have a couple that I can pull up that I've already found, but I'm, I'm trying to go through this process uh, with you. So something like this might be good. So as I'm going through, sometimes when I, when I uh, see an image that might work, I, I tend to right click on it, open it in a new tab, and then keep looking because it takes a while to find that, that perfect image. And like I said, Flickr's running really slow for me. Well, let, let's take this one. As, as the example, let's make sure that the size is pretty good. Okay, so it's, it's about double the last size. It's reasonable at 2,000 pixels by 1,000 pixels. It would be nice if it was even bigger, but I'll take it. So I'm going to go ahead and download the original. So it comes down. And let me show it in its folder. And then I'm going to right click on it and say open with Adobe Photoshop. Oh, how nice. OK, so as I'm looking at this particular image, and I start to, to look closely at it, let me zoom in a bit. Maybe, maybe not. Apparently, Photoshop conveniently froze for me. How nice. Right. See, it happens to me, too. All right, let's try that one again. All right, there we go. So let me zoom in. Control plus zooms in. And as I look at this person, I'm going to start with the girl. We've got a few things happening here. So she's fairly nice in contrast, the, the black shirt versus the background. That's going to be pretty easy to cut out. When we get down here to the, even down here to, to her feet, that's decent contrast. So that makes it a little bit easier to cut out. We do, however, have some problems right up in here in that hair. See how those hair wisps are, are floating out? That's one of the biggest challenges with Photoshop uh, and cutting out particular objects. So I'm going to start with her, and then I'll come over and do him afterward. So the first thing that I'll do is I don't want all the rest of this image. I can, I can shrink this down and not worry about what else is going on. So let me go ahead and use my crop tool, which is right here. And I'm going to drag the borders in so that I'm getting rid of the extra pieces. So like that. When I'm done, I'll click this little check mark to say OK. And now I have just her. Press Control-0 to zoom in on her. I have just her. 
to work with, which is reasonable. So now I need to go through and I need to cut her out. And like I said, there's a variety of techniques for how you might do this. The easiest one is, oh, I'll just pick the eraser tool. And if I'm working with the eraser tool, oh, one thing I do need, it's currently a background image, which means it's locked. I need to right click and say layer from background, which unlocks it and makes it an editable layer. Okay? With the eraser tool, I can simply just erase what's going on in the background. The problem here is if I make a mistake or if, I, if I'm trying to get too close, oh wait, I deleted too much of her shoulder, that's a problem. So then Photoshop came up with, let me back up here, something called the background eraser tool, which is down here, which is the next option. It has a little eraser with some scissors on it. And when you do that, you can essentially pick a color. So if I hold down Alt, I can sample a color. And then it will try to look for contrast. So as I go, let me zoom in here so you can see it a little bit. As I go in next to her, it looks for contrast and erases the background, which does a pretty decent job. OK, not bad. That was about Photoshop CS3 skill. So now we move forward into CS6, uh, which is what we have right now. And we're going to use a couple different strategies. The first one, and by the way, that background eraser would fail miserably on the hair. Therein lies the, the fundamental problem. It does OK on the sides, but not on the hair. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to look underneath the magic wand tool. And I'm going to go to the quick selection tool. All right, which is like a paintbrush and kind of a dotted line. And I'm going to go through and I'm going to select the person. And I kind of drag around and I start to select the person. Select a little bit more of her hair, about like that. We'll drag down here. Okay, And it does a pretty good job of finding where the edges are. And it gives me the little marching ants as I go through. But there were a few things that it did that I really didn't want it to do. So for example, Right here, that highlight on the side of her shoe, it thought that that was part of it, uh, or it thought that was part of the beach. If I want to add to the selection, I can come in here and, and continue dragging. Oop, it took a little bit too much. I can hold down the Alt key. Notice that the, in the center of my brush, I have a plus sign by default. If I hold down the Alt key, it switches to a minus sign. And when it does that, I could subtract from that selection. So I'm just fine tuning a little bit. We'll zoom back up here. That all looks OK. There's a little bit in here that needs to be selected. My brush is a little bit big right now, so I can use the bracket keys to make it a little bit smaller. And I'm going to hold down Alt to subtract from. And I'll work my way up there. There's also this little bit. So I'll hold down Alt, and we'll select that little bit there. I went a little bit far, so we'll add back right in there. And so it's a, it's a finesse thing. A little bit more, a little bit less, and you work your way around the object. Same thing here. Let me hold down Alt, and we'll get that up a little bit tighter. Maybe we have to add a little bit back, something like that. A little bit of a highlight on that sleeve. Work our way up. That's pretty good. Maybe a little bit more of that hair there. A little bit more in there. A little bit more up there. We need to subtract a little bit right in there. OK, so if I just worked with this, it's close, but again, it's not quite perfect. So Photoshop introduced something called Refine Edge. So as I'm working with the Quick Selection tool, right up here there's a button for Refine Edge. I'm going to click on that Refine Edge button. And we're suddenly going to see this in a little bit different light. And so by default, I have my view mode set to on black. So I can see really easily what's been cut out and what hasn't been cut out. And if I look at this, it's, it's kind of jagged. It's not the best looking just yet. So I can refine that a little bit as I go forward. So what I'm going to do is I have my, my brush here. I need to make that brush a little bit smaller. So let's drop that size down a little bit more, maybe like that. And I'm going to trace right over the edge of her shirt. And you see how much sharper that becomes? It gets rid of that extra little white halo. I'm going to work my way all the way along by painting right along the edge. And it's going to make a little bit better selection for me right along the edge. 
So this is called Refine Edge. There was a button up here for Refine Edge. And I'm just going to work my way around the objects here. Now sometimes, so here's an example. See how I'm starting to get some, some pieces that I don't really want? Well, you guys can't see it. <laughs> uh, but I can see it. There's a few pieces that I don't want. I can actually switch my tool from the refine radius to the erase refinements, which means I can go in and get rid of some of those mistake pieces. So I can tidy up those mistake pieces a little bit there. Uh, and so then we'll switch back to the refine radius. And I'll keep working my way around the object. Let me come back up here to the top. Now when I get to the hair, this is where it really starts to matter. I'm going to work through all of this particular section right in there with the hair. And you see that it's now, instead of being um, jagged, it's basically kind of worked with some transparency to mimic what's, what we're looking through with the various hair streaks. Let me work right there at the top, a little bit more there. Work right there along there, a little bit more right in there. All right, pretty good. Let me do a little bit more refining as we go down this side. And in my particular case, I think the on black is working really nicely for me. It would be useful, though, to point out that there are other modes as well. You could do an overlay mode, which colors stuff in pink. That can be useful. Um, there's a marching ants, which I don't really think helps much. Um, we can do it on white. We can do it black on white, which sometimes is the easiest way to see it. So in here, probably needs a little bit of refinement. We'll refine that up a little bit. Right In this black on white, we can see that there's a lot of stuff in here that I really didn't want. So I can switch over into that erase refinements, make this a little bit smaller. Make that even a little bit smaller. Make that a little bit bigger. Anyway, you, you're getting the idea. Okay? So when I'm done with all of this, I have some other, the other options that are available to me. And so thus far, we haven't dealt with any of the rest of these sliders. And I used to always have you set the sliders first, but I found that it's actually better to set them later because you can use the slider to your advantage to kind of decide how much of, of what you're doing you're doing. So smoothing increases the blur around your object. So obviously, I pushed it way too far. See how the object gets blurry? There's some fine line about showing the individual hairs. So here I am back down at 0. I could maybe go up to maybe 3. Oops. Darn it. I, I managed to undo my, my selection here. So let me concentrate just on the hair again. I committed to it. I pressed Enter. Um, so maybe. Maybe something like 1, maybe 2 would be good because it blurs it just a little bit. My feather is this kind of a, a similar strategy around. So you have to decide what's appropriate. Uh, we have contrast, which will sharpen up what we're cutting through or not. Uh, the shift edge, I would leave that set to nothing. The other thing that can happen, let me switch back to my uh, overlay mode, is sometimes colors from the background can leach into the hair. So it, there, there's a halo. It, you're shot against the blue background. Some of the blue color leaches into the hair. Uh, and you can choose to decontaminate the colors, which tries to get rid of that background color. So if you have a tint that's blue, it'll try to get rid of that blue tint. In my case, in this beach, there wasn't. it was white because the sky was kind of white. So it's not that big a deal. Then we come down here to the last section under Output. Output to New Layer with Mask. Um, sometimes Selection is set. Instead, do New Layer with Mask. And when I say OK, it's going to create a, a copy of the person. And then it's going to create a mask that cuts the person out. So if I look at the person right now, the person now is on that transparent background. So I've gotten rid of the background altogether because the mask is there. The advantage of using the mask to cut somebody out is that if you made a mistake, you can go back and fix it. Sometimes you don't see it 
right away. Uh, and you want to be able to see it. So in, in my case, um, I'm fairly happy with it. I have the colored version of this. Now I want a few other versions that I'm going to save as well. So this is the color version. I want a black and white version, and I want a silhouette version. I'm going to show you how to create both of those right now. The first one is to go to Layer, New Adjustment Layer. We'll do a Channel Mixer, which you guys have done before. Switch it to Monochrome. And then you can go through the presets and decide which preset is the right preset for what you're after. That's the black and white. Pretty easy. The last one, though, is I want to make her a silhouette such that I could, instead of having the, the colored or the black and white version, if I was going to collage her in, it's just a cutout. It's just a shape. And this is actually very, very easy. I'm going to go up to, um, sorry, why can't, layer, new fill layer, solid color. And I'm going to choose my color as, I thought I was going to choose it as white. There we go. It's going to ask me at that point after I say, OK, what the color is going to be. And I'm going to pick a 75% gray. So the easiest way to do that is here in the, we haven't talked about color theory just yet. CMYK is like a laser printer, cyan, magenta, yellow, and key is black, the K value. So I'm going to set everything to 0, 0, 0. And then K, I'm going to set to 75. I pick 75 because you can skew it really easily all the way to black if you want. And you can also lighten it up. It's kind of a medium value. So it's, it's of a lot of use, I think, for what you're doing. So I'll go ahead and say OK. So now I have a new fill color. But I do want to change this mask for that mask, because right now I have all gray. So let me go ahead and delete this layer mask. And I'll take this mask that I already have the cutout on. I'll hold down the Alt key, and I'm just going to drag that up to the color fill. And now she's cut out in that silhouette. So I didn't have to make the mask again. I made it once, and I used it multiple times. So I'll save this. I'll go to File, Save for Web. First one here, uh, use, use the full size image, whatever it is. Don't cut it down. And I will, let me get back to today. This is fall of 2017, if I can type. And we can say BH Walker. Um, and I'm going to add underscore gray for this. Then I'll turn off the gray. I have the black and white. I'll do file save for web. Same thing, it's the beach walker, but this is not gray. This is black and white, so BW. I should have mentioned, sorry, I forgot to tell you this. When you do this, you need to save it as a PNG. So when I do save for web, it should be set to PNG 24. If you don't save it as a PNG, if you save it as a JPEG, it will put a white background in for you. And then it won't be transparent, and you will have wasted your time. Not that you couldn't reselect it and, and work through it again. So I'm going to go with uh, PNG24. I'll save. And so we'll call this Beachwalker Color. And I'll go ahead and I'll click Save. OK, so I was, I was able to create the silhouette version. I was able to create the gray or the black and white version. And I was able to create the color version. OK, so three different pieces. You're going to do this starting with five people. Then you'll move on and do the tiling textures, which I'll do next. And then you'll come back and for the remainder of the time do as many more objects or people as you can. The bigger the library you have of people to work with, the easier it is long term. When you need a collage person, you can just go grab it. Um, there is also, however, on the website, a bunch of these for you to download. So if you go into your resources and you go to collage images, there are a bunch that people have already done before for you. So you can go into people. We can go to more people. They're separated by female and male. If you wanted to see male, you can go through and you can start to see, I don't know. My link must have gone wrong here. Yeah. Um, anyway, you can go through and you can start to pick through uh, the various images that people, there you go. This one loads. 
bunch of different people, and you can, you can pick from and use any of those images. So the better quality they are, the more likely they are to be used, et cetera. So when you do your post, uh, let me go to new post. You're going to do one post for each group of images. So you do, like in my case, I cut out one woman. There'll be three images related to her. I'll make one post for that. So you could theoretically make seven to 10 posts today, and that's to be expected, OK? So they're not all in one post. So th in this case, this was a beach walker. And when I upload my images, I'm going to upload all three files, if I can find it. There they are. So there's the three. I'll insert into the post. So all three images are there. I'm going to set my featured image as the colored version. There it is. And over on the right side here, I'm going to look for the section called collage images. I'll expand that, and then I'll try to, to as best I can, classify what she's doing. So she's walking. She's walking away. Um, let me see what else. Those are actions. All right, she's a female. You get the idea. You check these boxes, and that helps categorize. So if you're if you're searching for something, once that's done, I'll go ahead and post. You don't need to include your name in the post. You can if you want, because I'll see that it's that it's your post uh, when I look it up. So then I'll click publish. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. Okay. So it takes some practice to get there. The higher resolution the images are, the better. My particular image wasn't that high resolution, so you didn't get as much uh, refinement. I'm going to move on, and I'm going to do the tiling texture. And then I'll come back, and I'll do this one more time so you guys can see me do it. I'll pick a different image. And at that point, if you feel like you've got it, you can move on uh, and ignore me, or you can watch me do it again. Okay. So let me do the tiling texture next. So for a tiling texture, essentially what we want here is we want something that can repeat over and over and over again. And you can find these online if you do a Google search, for example. Uh, for tiling texture. These are examples of tiling textures. Uh, basically, what happens is if I were to take this image and I were to copy and paste it over and over and over again, this would match up so that it didn't have any seams. It would just repeat itself in all directions. And so we're going to create something like that for, for, what we're, for what we're doing today. I don't want to have something that already is a tiling texture. That defeats the purpose of what we're trying to do. So let me go back to my Creative Commons search. So search.creativecommons.org. And I'm going to look for wood siding. Maybe. So that one might already be a tiling texture. It looks like it is. Come on. How about wood? Flickr is so slow today. I wonder if I can search Google, Google Images. Let's do that instead. All right, let's look at this one. This is a pretty good one. OK, so when I look at something like this, I want to make sure that there's not any glaring issues. So for example, if I use this one as a tiling texture, we would see the same shingle over and over again, and it wouldn't look that good. Something like this, OK, that's probably, that's probably fairly reasonable. I could pick that uh, as an example. So let's work on that. I'm going to go to view the image in Flickr, maybe. Boy, Flickr is so slow today. OK, and then I'm going to go ahead and save the image as, let me put it into today's um, file here. Where am I? Where 
There we go. And then I'll go into Photoshop and I'll open that up. So I'll go to File and then Open. And we're in 107. There's my wood texture, like that. And so the idea here is that we're going to split this image down the middle and across this way. And we're going to take the pieces and rearrange them. So if I, if I draw this out like this, that is an awful marker. OK, so I have an image that looks like this. If I want this edge to match up with that edge, I can cut the image right here and take, let's say this is 1 and this is 2. I can take this piece and put it up here like that. Does that make sense? And I'm, the cut line that I made here is going to automatically seam together as I stack the images together. So if I had, let me see if I can illustrate this a little bit better, if I can find an eraser. OK, so I have this. This is one. This is two. I'm going to take piece two and stick it up here. So there's piece two. Then piece one can go back up here. And suddenly, you see how this tiles infinitely going along. The key here, though, is I have to do some work on this joint to make it tile together. The cut line here to here is always going to be seamed together just fine. But not only do I want to do it in this stacking direction, I want to do it in both directions. So I'm going to take it a step further and take the original image and cut it into four parts. So there and there. So I have one, two, three, and four. And I'm going to reassemble it so that we get four. Three is going to go to right here. Two is going to go to right there, like that. So I'm cutting up the image and I'm reassembling it. I'll show you right now what it does. We're going to do it using something called the offset filter. So in this case, a couple things before I actually do it. Uh, well, I'll do the offset first, and then we'll go back. I'm going to go into the filter menu, and I'm going to go to um, other and then offset. So it's filter, other, and offset. By the way, this is written out. I should have pointed this out earlier. If you go into tutorials, and you go to Photoshop, and you come down here to Tiling Texture 1.22. This whole thing is written out. So if you, if you get a little bit lost, it is there. OK, so back here. And essentially, what I want to do is I let me work in the horizontal direction. Right? If I set this about halfway across my image, do you see how it took one side of the image, cut it, and stuck it on the other side? I can do it in the vertical direction as well. It's just harder to see where the seam is. The seam's right across here right now. But I've got some problems. See how that edge doesn't line up with that edge? We need to correct that before we get into this. So I'm going to look back at my original drawing here, or my original piece of siding, and I want to look at these lines and make some adjustments. The rulers that go across the top and the side of my page can be my guide. I'm going to drag a ruler down and take a look at that line right there. And that's perfectly straight across. But if I did the same thing right here, see how that edge curls up? So I need to make an adjustment right there. And I'm going to do that using a skew. So I'll go to Edit, and it should be showing. But if it's not, you go to View and then Rulers. It should be checked. And um, what I'm going to do is go to Edit and then Transform. Oh, I can't do it yet because it's a, it's a locked background layer. Let me right click and say Layer from Background so I can unlock it. And then I'll be able to go to Edit. There's Transform and there's Skew. And what Skew does is it allows me to adjust essentially the perspective of the image a bit. So let me drop it down to right about there. Let me drop another one across the center here. OK, so that, that skew that I just did did a pretty good job of realigning all the images. Do you see how they're going across perfectly now? So I need to do a little bit of cropping. We'll go, uh, let me apply the skew. We'll go back to the crop, because obviously I can't have part of the image not showing. And I'm going to crop this right 
there where it goes across the bottom here. And at the bottom, I'm going to crop it to right there. The side to side is fine. I'll leave those. And I'll go ahead and say OK. And now when I go in back to that filter offset, so let me go to filter, other, and then offset. And I adjust it. See how this seam is a whole lot closer? You know what? Since the, the image is really dark for you guys, let me see if I can lighten this up a bit for you. Let me go to layer, new adjustment layer, and do levels. I just want you to be able to see it a little bit better. There we go. So I'll go back to filter, other, and then offset. We'll drag this one to about half its value. And we'll drag this one down. Oh, sorry. I have to do it on layer 0. Filter, other, offset. There we go. Let's drag this one down a bit. And so you should be able to see that seam in the center there. I have to do the same thing for the vertical direction, which you, we can see the seam. See right there, that line? So I have this line there, and I have this line right there that need to be fixed. So I'll go ahead and say OK once they're here. And now I'm going to use something called the clone stamp tool. It looks like a little rubber stamp on the side. What the clone stamp tool does is it copies from one area to another area. So let me come over here. See that black line there? I want to make that go away. And so I'll use my clone stamp. I need just a standard brush. And we'll make that brush a little bit smaller. And what I want to do is I want to copy from up above to down below. So I'll hold down Alt and I'll click right here as a target. And then when I come down here, it's going to be copying what's up above to what's down below. So as I go along, I'm just copying where that little cross, do, can you guys see the crosshair a little bit? Here, let me come back, let me come right to here. See right there, up above, that's where it's copying from. So I hold, I, I click, I hold down Alt to copy from there. I move down and I move my way along. And so there's a perfect example. See that white dot that was there? It copied the white dot. It's a nail. I copy that white dot down below. So I might not want that, so I'll copy from somewhere else and we'll cover that up. So I'll work my way along here to get rid of that little piece. Let me move over. I held down spacebar to do that. I'll work my way along. Oh. Over here, I need a little bit more, so let's continue along right there. And obviously, the more time I spend, the better this would be. I might also find that adjusting the hardness so that it's a softer brush, it might blur things in just a little bit better to make it a little bit easier. Now, I have to deal with the transition between these two pieces as well. They weren't quite set right. So I'm going to use a little bit bigger brush. I'll use my bracket key to make that a little bit bigger. I need to increase my hardness just a bit. I'm going to hold down Alt and copy right along this line. And I'm going to work my way down a little bit at a time to put those two together. So you see how I fix that line so it becomes seamless away as, it, as I go across. Let me do that again right here. We're going to start to work our way down. Oops, I went too far. Okay, I got a little bit too far, too carried away. So let me come back with this side, and we'll see if I can fix it there. Yeah, about like that. Now I have that double copy of that little piece, so I need to fix that as well. And I'm basically going to work my way up as I go further and further to make those two seamless. That one didn't turn out so well. This one turned out well. Take some practice to get through and, and get used to how this works. Once you've completed this, you'll be able to use this image and repeat it in an infinite direction, say on the side of a house or, or whatever. So it has advantages to it. Uh, and 
really the most important thing uh, in the course of today that I want you to understand is what the clone stamp tool does. Because sometimes you just need a clone stamp tool. And I'm trying to set you up for your assignment. You might need that. Okay? So I'm, I'm, I change things every semester. Last semester I didn't couple tiling textures with cutting things out. Um, but I know we're going toward a shorter semester, so I'm trying a few things. So uh, I said on here that I want you to do three tiling textures. I just want you to do one. Okay, just do one. Uh, we're searching for five posts of people that are isolated. That's the goal. Um, I'm going to do one more person right now just so you can see me go through the steps uh, one more time. But if you feel like you're comfortable and you want to just start working on it yourself, that's OK, too. Um, but I do want to go through it one more time. So I'm going to go to File and then Open. If you get there. And so if, OK, so I said five people, one tiling texture, and then five more people, objects, trees, whatever you want at that point. You're only required to work for the duration of the lab. So let's say you get to the end of the lab and you've only done four people. That's all you turn in. Does that make sense? So you don't have to do it as homework. Let's say you get through and you've done seven people. That's, you end at seven. So the, the, the goal is to finish everything by 10.50 today. And that's however much you turn in. OK? Um, so let me do this one more time with a person. I'm going to pick a person um, from last semester. We'll pick this person because her hair is particularly good for cutting out. So the resolution's a little bit higher on this one, and that's what I'm going to work with. So first thing I'll do is I'll crop to get rid of the extra person because I don't need the extra person. We'll crop her down just a little bit, and I'll say OK. Now I need to go through and I need to isolate her. So I'll use my quick selection tool right here, and I'm going to work my way around her. So let me zoom in here a little bit. And I'm going to make my brush a little bit bigger using the bracket key. Zoom out a little bit more. There we go. And I'm going to start selecting her. Oh, I missed the middle here, so let me hold down the Alt key to subtract, and we'll try to bring that up. I need a little bit more of her shoe, a little bit less of her shoe. The more time you spend really getting this right, the better the refined edge will work. Oops, Alt. We'll continue to add. There we go. Some of it's pretty easy. You can see that it selects some areas really easily. There we go. We'll do a little bit more of her hair. A little bit more right there. A little bit more right there. All right, so I've worked through, oh, I need to get rid of that little triangle. Let me hold down Alt, and we'll get rid of that. Little refinement right along there. Perfect. OK, so once I'm done with that initial selection, I'm going to work on her hair specifically. So I'll click on the Refine Edge tool. And again, in this, in this mode, I have the, the overlay so I can see kind of the pink. But let me do instead, let me do it on black. Or even better, black on white, so we can work through her hair here specifically. So let me zoom in. And let me increase the brush size. Oops, sorry. Let me increase the brush size a bit. Oh, it's going to make me do it from here. Yeah, about like that. And I'm going to work my way over the edge of the hair. And you can see, as I do it, it went from being that chunky setup to where it's actually seeing the individual hairs. This is a lot easier than going in and manually trying to do this. Okay? So I'll work my way through this edge. And I'll continue trying to work. Then I'm going to go ahead and go back to the on black here so I can see a little bit more of what's happening. So right there. Go right along that. There 
OK. So then we'll shrink this down a little bit. And I'm just going to work along our arms. But it did a pretty decent job. There's, there right in there, there's a little bit of jaggedness. See right on the cutout there? If I go through that, it's going to smooth it out a little bit. Remember, if I did too much, I can switch back to the Erase Refinements tool. And I can go in and I can get rid of some of the refinements. I can also switch to different modes. I could go on to white to see. So in that case, this shoulder didn't turn out as well as I thought it did. So let me go back and go back to my refine edge and see if I can clean that one up just a little bit. There we go. That cleaned up just a little bit better as well. Whoop, there's a little bit of hair underneath here that needs to go. So let's see if we can't fix that. Much better. So you see how I work my way through. Okay, and I work all the way around. Um, then I can work through, let me go back to my uh, black on white example here. Let me zoom out. There we go. And I can adjust the smoothness value up. So maybe I'll go up to 3. Maybe my feather at 0.3, just a little bit. Um, if I did too much, it's going to become too blurry. I want that refinement. I want those edges. So this is where being able to slide these can be useful, because you can dial it in for exactly how much you want in your particular image. Same thing here. How much smoothing do you want? Um, the decontaminate color option, let's see if that shows nicely here. Not too much reflection. It's mostly white reflection uh, as part of this. So I don't think it's going to do too much for us. So I'm not going to worry about it. Our output is going to be new layer with mask. That's the way we want it. And I'll go ahead and say OK. It gives us our cutout on top of our background. Let me go to 0 so we can control 0. See, we can see her on our background. So I have the mask to cut her out. I'll do the other two versions. First one is converting to black and white. So let me go to layer, new adjustment layer, channel mixer. I want her to be in monochrome. And then we'll go through and try the various filters to see which one looks right. Once I've decided on which one looks right, that'll be my black and white version. The last piece is to create that fill. So last time I did it with layer, new fill layer, solid color. And I specified 0, 0, 0, 75. If you're uncomfortable with that new fill layer, you could also just create a new layer and use the paintbrush and paint with 75. Let me make it a little bit bigger. And I could just paint it that way. Either way, doesn't matter. And what I want to do is I want to copy this mask up onto that layer. So I'll hold down the Alt key when I do this, and I'll drag this mask up on top of layer 1. And I've now cut her out uh, in silhouette form. Obviously, I didn't spend as much time. There's, there's issues down at the shoes and whatever. But I wanted to go through that refine edge one more time for you. Okay, So best thing for you to do is to try this out. If, you, if you're working along and it just you can't feel it's not cutting out correctly or the image is too jagged or whatever, it might be the source image. You might not have enough resolution to do it. You noticed when I did this one, it did a lot better job than when I did the one on the beach because the person was smaller and the original image was smaller for the one on the beach. This one was a higher resolution image, does a better job. You were all asked as part of your assignment or your exercise 103 to take pictures of people, so you should at least have five people that you can try. But of course, you can look for them online. Um, it's not fair for you to cut out people that are already cut out if that makes sense. So you can do a Google search, and you can look for people that have already been cut out. That doesn't count. You have to do your own cutouts. Um, otherwise, you can't learn the skills, which is important. Are there any questions? No? OK, yeah. Sure, I'll do the tiling texture again. Let me find another tiling texture example here and see if I can't. Uh, This will be a good one.
And I'm picking this because it's going to require more skewing than the other, uh, the other examples. OK, so here we are. I have this. this. I want to download this image. Let's get the largest size possible. And I'll go ahead and download it. No, I don't want to down. I'm just going to save the lower resolution image. OK, so I have that downloaded. I'll go back to Photoshop, and I'll go to File, and then Open. And I'm going to open up that image. So there it is. So now this image has a few other problems associated with it. And part of the reason that I picked this one is because I wanted to pick one with more problems. So in this case, the original photograph was shot in perspective. So as we look at this row of screws, let me switch to a pointer here. So we look at this row of screws, it's going off to a vanishing point up here. We'll talk about that next class. But I need to correct that as part of this so that it could tile. Otherwise, I'd have these screws that are always going at each other. So let me drag a vertical guideline. So from the ruler, I'm going to drag over to right there. From the ruler, I'll drag another one over to right there. And I'm working on this bottom set to start. Then I'm going to go to Edit. And I'm going to go, oh, I have to unlock the layer. It's a background layer. Let me right click and say layer for background. Why Photoshop brings in your original document as a background layer, it still baffles me. But it's just something Photoshop does. OK, there we go. So now I'm going to go to my Edit, Transform, and then I'm going to pick Skew. And I'm going to work with these upper corners to get the lines of screws here to be in alignment. And you kind of have to work both corners at the same time, because as you, as you adjust one, the other one will adjust too. All right, that looks pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and, and commit to it. And now I have these set up. Now, it's still a little bit um, in perspective, even though they're parallel. So it's going to fake us a little bit. But I'd like to stretch the image going out that direction just a little bit more. So I'm going to go to Edit, and then Transform again. And I'll go back to Skew. And this time, I'm going to pull these. I could have done these in one operation, but uh, I'm going to pull these up a little bit. Let me zoom out. Maybe to right about there. It wouldn't hurt me to double check that these go straight across. So my shadows go straight across. Let me zoom back in a little bit. OK, that one's pretty good. You always want to check it in a few places as the image. OK, so now that I have this set up the way that I want it to be, I'll go ahead and commit to it. There it is. And now it's a matter of starting to seam this together. A couple other things. One. The bottom here, I have two screws. The top one, I have one screw. I really should adjust the cropping of this image. I have more image there, so maybe I'll go to right there. I'm going to do it right in the little crack. And I'll do this one right in that crack. So I'm trying to think about how this is going to tile together. Uh, I also care a little bit about where the, the seam lines are going to go. So in this case, I want a mu as much space on either side here as I can, because those two screw lines are going to be close together as I tile it. So we'll do it right there. And now that I've picked that, it's a matter of doing that offset. So let me go to um, Filter, Other, Offset. And we can see that I was fairly close when I did the alignments. There it is, right about there in the center. Same thing here. Go down a little bit, right like that. Now I need to go through with the clone stamp. So I'll say OK, and now I need to start healing these together. So let me zoom in a bit. And this one's actually a good example because we can see differences in the grain, and, and we're going to have to do a little bit more work to, to match these up. So let me, um, let me zoom out one level. There we go. I'm going to pick the clone stamp tool, which is right here. 
And what the clone stamp tool does is it allows us to copy from one area to another area. So I'll hold down the Alt key and I'm going to copy from right here over that seam. Like that. Notice as I get too close to the bottom, I'm copying part of that um, transition. So I want to come over and copy that transition across. All right, until those start to become seamless. It may take a few tries. Oops, sorry, wrong key. To get this to really work nicely. Sometimes you have to blend these a little bit more, so I might need to adjust my softness of my brush down to try to blend that in a little bit more like that. And so that's starting to become seamless. I need to work through this transition here like that. I need to work through this transition along here. When you, do, when you do the offset filter, that's when it cuts it into the four pieces and rearranges them for you. Uh, it's because I did the both the horizontal and the vertical when I did the offset. So if you had it set so you didn't change the slider on both, then you would only do it in one direction or the other. So I'm going to continue working my way through and clone stamping and, and, and healing. And again, this is about learning the skills of working with the clone stamp tool, which is what I want you to learn. Um, this one, the, the seam is pretty obvious. I'll work my way through that. I also have this seam down here that has the double seam in it. So in that case, maybe I'll copy from up here, that seam, and change it over to this seam. And so you can see where that's the, the real advantage of the clone stamp tool is that you can, you can just very quickly copy one section to another. Uh, so now that's fixed. And I, I'll keep working through it a little bit more, uh, tying those together. In this case, you've got a little bit of a grain match problem as that's coming through. So you want to blend one side into the other. And then maybe I'll take this side out and pull it into that one a little bit more. So there's some, there's some art to how this goes together, but the more that you practice with it, the more you can start to seamlessly weave the two pieces together. Uh, once you're done, it becomes the tiling texture. You're going to save that, and then you can use that over and over again in collage work and stuff. You will use these later on in the semester. So it's not something that I'm just isolated telling you, oh, you should learn to do this. You'll need this skill a little bit later on, depending on your collage work down the road. Okay. So uh, I went through isolating the objects. I've gone through tiling textures. It's time for you guys to try this out. Remember, I just want you working through the end of the lab period. And you post however far you get uh, for the end of the lab period. Any other questions? No? All right.